Alleluia. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that your grace has given us in this service today, already in the songs we sung, to return to the cross of our salvation, to consider the fundamental act of sovereign redemption, where our sins were atoned for by our substitute Lamb of God's sacrifice, Christ, our Savior, our Lord. We pray now as we open your word that we would return to you, crucified, dear Jesus, in the pages of your scripture, that it would remind us of the significance of this event, that we would live in light of its truths and proclaim it to others who are yet dead in their trespasses and sins. Lord, we know that resurrection is impossible, that hope is nowhere to be found, and that there is no salvation apart from one dying in our place, our Lord Jesus Christ. Remind us of these things also at your table as the elements that represent the cost of our redemption are here for the partaking. Those who approach your table, Lord, have partaken them by grace through faith, by the miracle work of the Spirit in their hearts, awakening them, awakening them to the truth of the gospel. Lord, remind us of these things and more as we seek to grow in faith and understanding and in obedience to our Lord and Savior who died in our place. May his name be glorified. May his name be exalted in this place and through the lives of those who hear, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Today, as you are seated in this place, in this sanctuary, you are seated, as it were, around a table of fellowship. That is, a meal and an occasion where the central bonding agent, the Holy Spirit, alive and well in the hearts of His people, has created for Himself a body, a church, of living stones that praise His holy name. Today, as we later on partake at the Lord's table, these are the things that we rem remember and proclaim. And this morning, as we open the Scriptures, we do so with a reminder from the Apostle Paul himself in 1 Corinthians of the significance of what takes place here in this service. Turn with me as you're able to 1 Corinthians 1 and let us continue in our first Sunday of the month series, 1 Corinthians. So we've recently turned to this book for the occasion of our communion Sundays. Today we'll consider the greater portion of chapter 1, Lord willing, verses 11 through 31. In a moment we'll stand for the reading of God's word. The aim of this morning's message is to proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ, which is our unifying confession. This is the proclamation, the conviction of the apostle, and this is the point of contact. This is the word and message that he returns the attention of this early church to, and they needed it. The title of this morning's message is Christ Crucified. That is essentially the title of the theme of Paul's ministry. He preached Christ crucified. We learn more of what that means, and in context, we learn application of that concept as well today. With your hearts open and out of reverence for the Word of God, would you stand as you're able for the reading of the Scriptures this morning? This is 1 Corinthians 1. Let us consider, behold, the Word of God in verses 11 through 31. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power." For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discerning discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. 30. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Praise God for His Word. Praise God for the corrective authority of the apostolic record. And praise the Lord because these reminders are needful in every day and age, even as Paul writes to address the first of the issues that troubled him and occasioned this letter. What was to be the basis for the same mind and judgment that would establish the unifying principle among believers in Corinth and among believers everywhere? Remember verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, Paul is making his case, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the ground of the authority, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you. Paul is is, uh, eager and he is striving to encourage, exhort the church that that they not be divided and full of strife and at odds with one another, but instead, he says, but that you may be united in the same mind and the same judgment. In order for people to share a mind and judgment, if you will, to have the same mindset and the same application based on that worldview, that frame of mind, that frame of reference, or that point of contact, in order for that to happen, there must be a unifying principle. They must share something in common. They must both agree to something that's foundational to the nature of that relationship, that covenant, that identity, that unity. Paul had received reports of schism, that is, fighting and differences, people at odds with one another within the church. Factions, groups, were developing around uh, various burgeoning ministries in the early days of Christianity. We see several references to men of influence, Apollos, Cephas, uh, Paul himself. Factions were developing around these men, that is, groups of people who identified themselves with these particularly influential, impressive, or valued preachers. This tendency likely mirrored a worldly trend at the time. In other words, where did the people get this idea? Well, likely from the Greco-Roman culture that surrounded them, that characterized their experience in the world in which they live. Sophisticates, important people, people who pursued knowledge at the time, they would often devote themselves to various philosophers who sought a following in competition with and at the exclusion of other academics. So at this time, on this model then, each teacher was presumed to be an island of authority unto themselves. Paul rejects this mindset. He refuses to be considered even in himself as an island of authority. And instead, he directs the attention of his readers to the authoritative message of the cross. I'm reminded of the Bereans. These were the people who, when they heard the word of God from the authoritative apostle, did not take it at face value or on authority of the human messenger bringing it, although Paul had a unique authority as an apostle, but instead did what was commended to them, what they were uh, blessed for doing. They went to the scriptures to verify the message as it came to them. And this is what Paul is endorsing here. Each teacher is not to be presumed to be an island of authority unto themselves. Paul rejects this mindset. He directs the attention of his readers to the authoritative message of the cross, the gospel, the work, the ministry, the teaching of Jesus Christ. In two words, Christ crucified. By this standard, teachers are verified and unity of the faith is established. Christ crucified, that will establish the same mind and same principle, or same judgment, that unifying principle of all the true church. In the end, these reforms that Paul is advocating for here 
will serve to glorify the Lord rather than foster a celebrity class within the church. Upon this true gospel, no mere human being has grounds for boasting. Rather, Paul reminds us of these words from Jeremiah. In the close of this chapter, he quotes, saying, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Verse 11 of our passage today introduces the first of the issues Paul writes to address. He has heard, heard reports of infighting at Corinth. And what does he prescribe for this infection within the body of Christ? And our text today answers this. So here's our heading this morning. What unites the church? In three categories or three subpoints, main points, I suppose, under this. What unites the church? Paul's answer, number one, the credibility of Christ, verses 11 through 19. Number two, the very content of the gospel, verses 20 through 25. And number three, what unites the true church? The nature of our calling, verses 26 through 31. Who is your greatest influence? Who is most influential in our day? We're familiar with the term influencer, social media influencer. These are people who have the power, it's presumed at least, to shape the opinion of others. Well, this was an issue back then, though they didn't have technology, social media, and so forth. They did have influencers at the time of Paul's writing. Among them, we see three, four, in fact, if you count Christ, Apollo, Cephas, Paul himself, and Jesus. What is the object of baptism? What is the basis of unity? Who is your greatest influence? Let me see if I can pull up this picture. Year, uh, some years ago, there was a kind of a mini scandal surrounding a influential megachurch leader in our day. I'll go ahead and say his name, Stephen Furtick, pastor of Elevation Church, I think in Georgia somewhere. Well, there was a coloring book at the church at the time. Somebody had the presence of mind to take a picture of one of the pages in the page you won't be able to see this, but in giant words at the top, it says unity. I just couldn't pass this illustration because it so perfectly fit our text today. Unity, and underneath that it says, we are unified under the visionary. There's a verse quoted, Romans 13. Everyone is subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, Romans 13.1 little tagline at the bottom of this coloring book page. Elevation Church is built on the vision God gave Pastor Stephen. We, all, uh, we will protect our unity in supporting his vision. Is that a good application of 1 Corinthians 11 through 31? Does Paul say, you will protect the unity of the church if you support my vision? Of course not. This is a misguided example of what is to be the organizing principle of a church. What does establish the same mind and same judgment for a people? Is it the ambition that your pastor here standing before you has? Listen, I got vision up the wazoo, let's roll with it. Modified quote from Jack Black in some movie I vaguely remember. No, the answer is no. To be in the same mind and same judgment, we all must focus our attention on something, if we are to glorify God, that is worthy of that priority. And Paul knew in and of himself he was not worthy of the priority of the focus of the church. Neither was his plan and vision for how the gospel would be spread, except and only insofar as he preached Christ crucified would he boast. And so he points to Jesus Christ and says here, in the teaching, work, ministry, and redemption of the Almighty who stooped low and took on flesh, we will be of the same mind and same judgment. This is what it means to be baptized. Like we said before, it's not so much who baptized you, that's of little to no importance, but it's who, rather, you are baptized into. Paul gets into this. It's been reported to me from Chloe, bunch of quarreling, verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul exasperated. He's expressing his frustrations. It, it troubles him to think that people would focus on him 
versus another apostle and, then, and thereby lose their focus on what is to unify and ground the church. He says in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Then as if an afterthought, he remembers as he's writing, verse 16, oh, I did baptize well, parenthetical statement, the household of Stephanus, or Stephanus. Beyond that, I know not whether I baptize anyone else. And Paul's saying, I, I don't have, in the beginning of my Bible, a brag page of how many people I've baptized. That is of little consequence, so much so that I can't really remember exactly who I baptized. Why? Because that is not the important thing. He says, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but what? To preach the gospel. And not with eloquent words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. What is the object of baptism? It's that Christ would be glorified and that we would identify with Him in His death, His resurrection, and in His work. That's what baptism represents. Not that we identify with Paul or the teaching of Apollos, first and foremost, or that of Cephas, Peter. Cephas was the Aramaic name for the apostle Peter. Three questions illuminating basic gospel realities that Paul references here. After stating the nature of the case, the strife that plagues the church, he asks rhetorically, is Christ divided? What's the answer, church? Is Christ divided? No, he is not divided. So do not divide yourselves by other principles of unity short of Christ crucified. Was Paul crucified for you? What's the answer, church? No, Christ, uh, Paul is not crucified for you, but Christ alone is the redeeming and unifying power, authority, and source of his church. He is the head through which all the members are organized. Here Paul is, it seems to, to me, anticipating uh, pictures that he will expand upon later, including the body of Christ as many parts, all connected to the central unifying uh, force, the pivotal and crucial element, which is Jesus Christ, the head of a properly functioning, ordered church. Uh, so Christ is the head, not Cephas, not Apollos, not Paul, but Jesus alone. And then third question, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And again, the answer is no. So in these three questions, Paul immediately emphasizes rhetorically, Christ is undivided. And secondly, redeeming hope is found only in the sacrifice of Jesus alone. And thirdly, baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. It is not important who baptized you so much as who you are baptized into. This is one of those passages we go on in verses 14 and 15, where Paul, as an apostle, thoroughly opposes and refutes false notions of authority within the church continues to be a pressing issue today as it was then. We gave one sort of megachurch seeker-sensitive example of where these words might apply, but there are other much more entrenched historical examples of notions of magisterial, that is, church leader, authority, and a pecking order or a hierarchy within the structure of the church that deserve to be critiqued and opposed by Paul's words as well, thinking primarily here of Roman Catholic or other traditionalist notions of the authority of the church or the unifying element of the church as a community. Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, what is, he, what is he quenching here? Well, bragging rights. Dude, I was baptized by Paul. And who were you baptized by? Oh, his disciple. Well, that's all right. You know. But like, you could see if someone valued first contact with early apostles. This is a guy who raised the dead by the power of God. This is a guy who himself was raised from the dead. Wouldn't it be awesome to be baptized by Paul? Paul didn't think so. Why do we? You see, these false notions of elevating a mere person in the place or in competition with the glory that Jesus alone deserves is a perennial, it's a very common tendency in our hearts. Instead of looking to Christ alone in our sin and in our flesh and in our tangible experience, we tend to substitute other heroes for what he alone is jealous of, his name, his authority, his redeeming power. You see, on Roman Catholicism, it matters a whole lot where you are in these false ways of judging authority. And this, according to the scriptures, these here I just read, we are not to exalt one above another, 
based on early church prominence, uh, some privileged hierarchy, some mystical or political notions of apostolic succession. Imagine how a person's resume might be enhanced on these notions if he could brag, I was baptized by Paul or by another church father. For Paul, who himself was an apostle, he declares clearly and decisively that all such notions are deluded. Church unity, continuity, and authority rests squarely on the preaching of the gospel. A theologian that I respect, because he preaches the word of God, James White, says it this way, there's no apostolic succession without the succession of the teaching of Jesus. If somebody claims to have an authority chain all the way back to Peter, and they're not teaching and preaching the gospel, rightly divided, applied, and understood, I mean, you can throw that out right away. Because Paul says you are to judge every teacher on the basis of what they proclaim. Do not uh, elevate any other secondary issues to a priority in your mind to establish unity or judgment. No, the cross, which is folly to those that are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is what destroys the wisdom of the wise. Man's ways of ordering his affairs are judged by the word of God. And don't empty the cross of Jesus Christ as its power, from its, of its power by elevating something else above him as the primary point of unity. No human agent, no mere man, whether it be a visionary in our day or some notion of apostolic succession and some false hierarchy of magisterial prominence that we see in other uh, traditional forms. Folly versus power, 17 and 18. What I'm saying to you does not make sense to many people. It appears as folly to them. But it, in, in fact, is the real, where the real power lies. According to Paul, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Where does the real power and real authority reside? What, and notice the priorities that were corrupting the integrity of, of the church at Corinth. There are factions within the church that were organizing themselves around arbitrary reasons and presumptions. And these, if they were allowed to continue, would conspire to empty the cross of its power. A lesson here, left to its own devices, that is our sin and our tendency as mere fallen humans, left to our own devices, the church tends to make common cause with the world. At this time, it was sort of that a philosopher competition mentality. Well, I follow Apollos. I'm a Paulian. I'm a Pauline. I'm a Sephite, <laughs> and so forth. So people were identifying themselves with their favorite teachers. But this ran the risk of emptying the cross of its power. And as they were doing this, they, in fact, ironically, were parting ways with the true church if they would maintain these distinctions, these schisms, these factions, and these differences. Convicted believers would be convicted by the Holy Spirit not to embrace these misguided priorities corrupting the integrity of the church. And we are to recognize today, as they needed to then, that notoriety and celebrity are tempting uh, uh, things to notice or, or things to elevate and prioritize, as well as eloquence or conventional wisdom. But according to Paul, celebrity, eloquence, and conventional wisdom are not the foundation upon which the church is built. Christ did not uh, proclaim, or, or Christ did not send me with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. He did not send me to baptize as if I were a celebrity or an important individual and my baptism had an extra power over that of another, but instead to preach the gospel. Paul references a passage from the Old Testament to highlight his point. Let's turn there, Isaiah 29, 13 and 14. I believe he quotes 14, but those two verses in context really underscore his message here. In Isaiah 29, 13, we read this. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. 
Notice the people had a quote-unquote fear of the Lord, but it was rooted in something of error. It was a fear of Him that was a, merely a commandment taught by men. And therefore, God, being jealous for His glory, was prophesying a destruction of the wise men and their wisdom and their discernment. So here, this Paul is speaking to fundamental fear. Uh, in young people's class this morning, we were talking about the fear of the Lord. And our study book insightfully made the point that fear is inescapable. It's not that as a human being you won't fear anything. It's a matter of who you fear. Do you fear man or do you fear God ultimately? If you fear God, then you judge men by that superior authority, what God's word has said. And that is what Paul is pushing for here. If you fear men first and foremost, then your ideas, your religious connections, your associations with Christianity will be based upon the fear of another. Uh, here's a question for you. Why are you a Christian if you identify as a Christian? Are you a Christian because, this is first and foremost, uh, let me ask you this, are you a Christian because that's the way you were raised? If so, if you're a Christian first and foremost because that's the way you were raised, what does that mean? That means that your, quote, fear of the Lord is a commandment merely taught by men. It was right and proper that your parents should teach you the ways of the Lord. Well, once the Lord changes a heart and you are convicted, you are transformed, you are a true believer, the mark of that fundamental born-again experience is, is you realize Jesus Christ crucified is my Lord, Savior, and authority. I'm not a Christian first and foremost because my parents taught me, although I'm so thankful for what they said, I know it was valuable and precious to me. Why? Because it's what the scriptures say. Again, I ask, why are you a Christian? Well, my spouse is a Christian, and I really find that it has done a lot for her, and I, I, I respect that. And so I, I'm here because my spouse is here, my husband or my wife. Oftentimes, that relationship can be one where people go to church because someone in their family goes, or you think to yourself, why am I a Christian? Well, the peer group that I have, they're respectable people. I share a lot of values. I really appreciate it. the church community. I appreciate that as well. If these are the fundamental reasons why you are a Christian, they fall short of what it means to truly be saved. There is a fundamental fear, and that fundamental fear is a heart transformation that recognizes Jesus Christ is Lord, and it is upon His authority that we judge everything else. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Paul goes on to say, you know, where is the wisdom of the wise? Superficial, the people in Isaiah's day had a superficial relationship with the Lord and a superficial worship of the Lord. Their hearts did not match their words because their quote-unquote fear ran no deeper than the commandment taught by men. This underscores Paul's primary point on credibility. The people, quote-unquote, feared the Lord because they feared men, when it ought to have been the other way around. Do you, quote-unquote, fear the Lord because you fear men? There are primary and secondary allegiances that Paul is identifying here. Someone might revere Apollos and declare his faith in Christ on Apollos' recommendation. I find this man so impressive that I'd go ahead and adopt his views of Jesus. There's a world of difference between that and someone who values the teaching of Apollos because his ministry is true to the gospel. And that's basically what we're getting at here. What is the principle of unity? What is the foundation? What establishes the same mind and judgment? Is it Stephen Furtick? Is it Apollos? Is it Cephas? Is it Paul? Or is it rather Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Why are we a believer? Does our faith rest on anything other than Jesus Christ fundamentally? If so, we have fallen short of what it means to be a believer the influence of all these other things is all right and good as a secondary one. But primarily, let us pray as church leaders. Let us pray as parents. If you know Jesus, may it be a prayer that others honor, respect, 
and value everything of Christ that we have to say because according to the scriptures, it is the word of God. So parents, what am I telling you? I'm telling you when your kids ask why, your primary answer should not be because I said so. Although God has given you a delegated authority, your primary answer should be because God has said so and he has given me the responsibility to tell you his truth. And in those discipline opportunities and in the order of your home, each time the flesh and sin flares up, might be rare in your household, it's common in mine, <laughs> a little tongue in cheek. We're all sinners and we demonstrate as much, especially growing up when our flesh can run wild. The, each moment when our flesh arises, it's an opportunity to ground our teaching of our children, for instance, parents, in the authority of the Lord. This also is my duty in preaching. I am to point you to the scriptures to verify what I say. I'm not to impress you with my insights or intellect and then secondarily go to the scriptures. No, you are to take what I say according to the scriptures and judge the exposition accordingly. And in this, the credibility of Christ then becomes the unifying principle of the church. What unites the church? The credibility of Jesus Christ. Second major point the content of the gospel. What unites the true church? What the gospel says, the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verses 20 through 25 in our primary text. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The content of the gospel, this is what unites the true church. What do we find impressive? What moves us and makes us go, huh, that's a good point. Is it what the world, the Greek or the Jew in the examples here, considers important and profound? Or is it what they consider folly, but indeed is transcendent in its authority and its value, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul says that there's a real showdown of wisdom. On the one side, that's folly, you're stupid. On the other side, no, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, embracing the absurdity of the devil's first lie. And I'm here to tell you the truth. Christians are idiots. I can't believe what they say. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. And on the other side, may you who are blind in your trespasses and sins repent that you might be able to see and to behold yourself in light of the truth of God. So long as you fear your own mind and your own uh, impressions, fear yourself over God, you'll always think the gospel is folly. This is the showdown that Paul faced every time he went out to preach the gospel. On the one side, the wisdom of the world, which, was, uh, which uh, everybody agreed, there was great consensus around. And on the other side, it was the wisdom of God, which the world found to be foolish and folly. This showdown goes all the way back to the garden, does it not? Think of Genesis 3, 1 through 5. The serpent was crafty, more crafty than Eve. How did he snag her? And Adam was the ground of his deception. Wow, it seemed like he was really onto something. He was making good points in their estimation. And what were some of these points? In Genesis 3, verse 1, just to remind you, the fundamental conflict in the soul of every fallen human. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the, uh, of the field. And that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Later, verse 5, for the Lord knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman rejected the word of God, which is on the day you eat this, you will surely die, adopted the wisdom of Satan and believed him when he said, there's reason to doubt God's word, and this tree is actually the key to great wisdom. And she consumed the fruit, gave some to her husband, and thus our first parents fell. And what was the cause of their fall? Well, they ate the fruit, surely, yes, but the real deception was is 
There's a wisdom independent of God that you can have for yourself. So you can be on at least equal plane with him. Wisdom versus wisdom. The word of God versus the word of the serpent. This is a conflict as ancient as the garden, as the garden fall of man. Hath God said? The question and then the promise, you can be as God. Every time we go out to proclaim the gospel, we face that same conflict. On the one side, people acting as if God's word is questionable and as if they were God determining for themselves the destiny of their own lives. But in this colossal and cosmic showdown, there can only be one winner, God versus the devil, the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ and him crucified versus whatever folly the philosophers could dish up at any given time. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Paul sets up this dichotomy, this difference. The cross, when it is proclaimed, it is picking a fight with everyone until they repent and believe. Christ crucified does not satisfy the market demands of unrepentant sinners in any age. Christ crucified, no one is thirsty for this message until God changes their heart and praise God he does. When God changes your heart, and you become thirsty for living water. You become hungry for that which you can sink your teeth into unto eternal life. First of all, it takes a fundamental transformation. And what you once considered folly, you now hang on to with all your heart and soul. But until that happens, the cross is foolishness. Christ crucified does not satisfy the market. It's not something that we're interested in. This is a mistake I can easily make. I sometimes think to myself, well, we are demonstrating to ourselves the absurdity of secular thinking in, you know, just in spades in our world today. And perhaps when people realize that it's so stupid to say that a man can be a woman or vice versa and to declare uh, basically independence from reality, maybe at some point this culture will wake up that we live in God's world. After all of the fallout and consequences and chickens coming home to roost of our absolute rebellious absurdity, well, certainly those consequences are coming fast and furious. And certainly the minds of man are changing a trend that was popular in the internet three years ago may be obscure today, but one thing remains the case. Men are interested in answering their questions until they repent and of, their, of themselves and their sin. They're interested in answering their questions by anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But Paul will not compromise with these people, whether they be Jews who seek sign or Greek, Greeks who seek wisdom. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. We preach Christ, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. So these are two examples of what people were interested in at the time of Paul's preaching. Jews were interested in signs of like political deliverance and national triumph, not interested in taking up their own cross and following Jesus, not taking up that is, in the mind of the Jew at the time, the humiliating torture device of our depraved oppressors and suffering for, for the name of one who willingly surrendered to Roman tyrants, the Jew who is hoping for deliverance from this political boot on their neck, not realizing that in Christ political deliverance comes in time, but primarily deliverance from sin is a priority for every individual. It matters not who rules you so long or as much as it matters who rules your heart. And until you're delivered from the clutches of Satan, everything else is a tempest in a teapot, or metaphorically, as we say, rearranging the deck chairs on the furniture. The Jews were not interested in why the hull of their covenantal ship was sinking. They were not interested in acknowledging the iceberg that had dashed the integrity of their vessel, which was their unfaithfulness to the covenant. No, they were looking for a short-term Hail Mary pass physical Messiah in many cases who would deliver them. And that's, thus they missed the signs that Jesus did because they weren't the kind of signs they were looking for. Greeks, Gentiles, they were interested in the promise of human intellect where man had failed to transcend his limitations with brick and stone. You know what? I got an idea. Let's build the Tower of Babel with philosophy and reason. And so this human intellect project in the mind of the sophists at the time, whether you be Epicureans or Stoics, those who gather in Mars Hill to solve the world's problems, 
on the basis of their own reasoning, philosophy, and thinking. This is what they were interested in. Where man had failed in the past, they would succeed. Wait, the Greek says, I must have faith like a child in this obscure, reviled Jewish man? I'm not impressed by that. I am a student of Aristotle. I sat at the feet of Plato's uh, disciples who taught us that we can find a firm place to stand in our own reason and acquire knowledge by means of our own intellect. Today, the gospel still offends on both accounts. This is not the power. These are not the signs the unrepentant unbeliever is looking for. But are there signs? And is there power in the gospel? Yes, there is true power and true wisdom in Jesus Christ. And those who recognize it are the called, the changed heart ones. Verse 24, but to those who are called of these two categories, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And Paul knew this personally. He was one of those rebels, a religious leader who sought to stamp out the early church because he felt it violated the history and traditions that he valued. On that day, on the road to Damascus, when God interrupted him with a blinding light from heaven, you better believe he saw a sign. That sign included the words of Jesus audible to him, deafening in his ears, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And a sign of God's power to judge him immediately struck blind, followed by the wisdom of the gospel that would be proclaimed to him when he went into the city and Ananias prayed for two things, one, that his spiritual sight would be restored, and secondly, that his physical would as well, and thus a sign joined wisdom, the legitimate ones, and Paul was anointed, called, and heart changed to all of a sudden soak up like a sponge all the beautiful wisdom of the whole council of God and became the foremost uh, preacher of the early church and missionary and wrote so much of the New Testament. The foolishness of God, Paul knew firsthand, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Today, as then, what is the kind of power we're not interested in? What are the signs that we overlook? Well, in our sin, we dismiss the witness of covenant history. The record of the scriptures that we've been painstakingly documenting out of Genesis ourselves, those connections, what God has revealed in so many incredible details, so many facets of his revelation. That is lost on the unbeliever. It's not the wisdom. It's not the power they're looking for. What else is lost then? The incarnation, the fact that God could become a man, the Trinity, one being, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are ridiculous on their false logic, contradictory thought to the modern sophist. Jesus' miracles, unimpressive to me. If I was going to do a miracle, I'd solve world hunger. I wouldn't turn water into wine. What would I do? I'd stop all war. I would stop uh, climate change. I wouldn't walk on water. Jesus' miracles are unimpressive. They're not the kind of power the unbeliever is looking for. But if he knew the wisdom behind these works of Jesus, he would recognize that when our Savior stepped upon the waves, he was demonstrating on that act that he is Lord of the chaotic sea. That by his word, that sea parted in the days of Moses. That sea came into existence at the creation week. And that sea will not all flood you, well-deserving sinner, if you hang on to Jesus who walks upon the waters of eternal judgment. This is the wisdom of Jesus walking on the water that the sophist, that the Greek and Jew today, you know, lost their trip, so to speak, trespasses and sins, misses the power and the authority and the wisdom of God. They're not interested in it. Why? Because they have their own ideas. They have their own frame of reference. They fear themselves or other pagan influences. Jesus' ascension, the acts of the apostles are unimpressive to the heart, yet hard and dead in his trespasses and sins. The wisdom of the scriptures does not strike them as valuable or important. Think of Joseph himself and the wisdom that is testified to in his life, not just his ordering things so as to save the world from famine, but also as he pictures the coming Jesus Christ, whose suffering prepared the way to save his entire covenant family. These are the kinds of things that are, they represent true power and true wisdom. But the unrepentant heart remains yet blind to them. Nevertheless, 
What is to unite the church? The content of the gospel. We're not to compromise the content of the gospel, to make it more palatable to what people value and promote these days. No, we are to preach it undiluted, unadulterated in its original power and authority and pray that, that by that means the Holy Spirit would do a miracle, that the content of the gospel would change hearts as God cha- uh, awakens the heart once dead as stone to newness of life, puts it on the potter's wheel and begins to shape it into his image. Third and finally, what unites the true church? The credibility of Jesus Christ, the content of the gospel, and thirdly, the nature of our calling. Paul instructs us to consider a calling that is us by way of Corinth, the church who he originally writes to, verse 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. So, Uh, You see there three references, wisdom, power, and nobility. Notice Paul will contrast that in 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Turn with me to that second reference from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 9. (coughs) Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Paul references this passage. And once again, the context here of just these two verses underscores his point. You see here, even in the way that Paul preaches and exhorts the church, he references the scriptures as his authority. Verse 23, Jeremiah 9, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. Oh, excuse me, wrong chapter, sorry. It's chapter 10. Uh, Chapter 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, 24, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Uh, People are concerned with the direction of American society. Every news clipping you read or every report on the internet, every foreign policy decision seems to raise the danger signs and the level. There's even like that uh, countdown clock to the apocalypse or whatever. It's like, how close are we to the end of the world? And it's like 1159, 1159 and a half, 1159 and three quarters, you know, midnight being world destruction or whatever. Well, that's sort of like a farciful category to judge where we're at, but it does illustrate something to you the paranoia of the people who live in this unsatisfied, uh, a disquiet, not knowing or not having any framework for stability. So in times like this, men cry out like the Jews did of old for a savior, do they not? We need powerful people with a lot of money who can throw a Hail Mary pass and set everything right, use a football analogy. Elon Musk is a guy who comes to mind. You might agree with some of what he says, uh, depending on the day that which you check the charts, he might be the richest person in the world. He's a guy who has aspirations, you know, above and beyond an ordinary person. He's got a plan to take us to space. His wisdom, his might, his riches, perhaps that will save us in the final hour. No. Let the wisdom, let the wise man not boast in his wisdom. Let Elon Musk repent of all of his good-hearted intentions inasmuch as they represent a substitute for Jesus Christ alone. Let him turn to Christ and realize he doesn't have the power to change or save anybody by the use of technology or money, no matter how altruistic or humanitarian he might appear. He's not the only so-called celebrated on the hero on the left. You might have a guy who claims that he can solve world hunger or clothe the world or whatever. All these different foundations, all these different individuals, they step up to fill that market demand for a hero. Let the wisdom, let the might, and let the riches of the most important and prominent among us, at least let them try to address our plight. No, the scriptures say, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, 
that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth. There is nothing holding this world together except for the steadfast love of the Lord. His providential care and common grace is undeserved. And every sin that humans collectively or individually commit makes that point all the stronger. Nevertheless, he sustains us in spite of what we deserve. This is our Lord. And Paul says, as we point ourselves to him, that is, the nature of our calling establishes and unites the true church, understanding who we are and who Christ is against the false hopes of the unbeliever. We are believers, and as believers, we are in service of not pointing to other saviors, but instead his glory. 26, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Without time to turn there, you might mark for future study. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 9, God sets the people, or he basically sets them straight right from the get-go as they leave during the Exodus. It's not because you're many in number, because you're strong, important, and powerful that I chose you to be my people. Rather, because you are few in number, I will do great things for you. The same message that Gideon heard. Gideon, you got too many people, too many soldiers to fight this battle. Really? Too many? That seems like folly to the wisdom of man. You should get as many numbers of you know, qualified, equipped, and trained soldiers as possible. The best opportunity to defeat the enemy. No, rather, you should invest your hope in the glory of God, who will be championed all the more by taking a mere 300 and upsetting all the thousands of the Midianites in one fell swoop. The nature of our calling is that we, as believers, are in service of the glory of the Lord. God has strategic purposes in exalting the lowly. Was this not the message of Mary's own Magnificat? Why have you chosen me? A poor, a, a person of no importance, no nobility, no a privileged birth, not wise or rich the way the world judges. Well, it was to glorify himself, dethroning the proud and raising the lowly, the wise, the powerful, and the noble. No, we rather are the foolish, the weak, and the low, and the despised. If we go to heaven one day, and as we do in Christ, what, a ma what an amazing message it will be. It will glorify the Lord. He was able to save a people as least of all, or uh, deserving of it, like, or not deserving of it in any way like we were and are in our sin, and also people who were able to spread the gospel in spite of what the little they had to offer by way of what the world judges and finds uh, valuable and, and finds impressive. We are people in service of His glory. We are uh, believers by virtue of the wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of Christ. And this is our source. He says in verse 30, He is the source of our life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. And finally, we are believers in order to boast in the Lord. As Jeremiah 9, 23-24 reiterate, boasting not in our own wisdom, might, and riches, but boasting instead that we understand and know the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. Paul says that believers who understand these things, that they exist in service of the Lord's glory by virtue of His wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, which the Lord willing will consider at greater depth in a later message, and in order to boast in the Lord. If a church is made up of people that share this in common, they will be united and powerful. What unites the church? The credibility of Jesus Christ, the content of the gospel, Christ crucified, and the nature of our calling, humble, unlikely vessels in the service of his glory because of what he has done in order to boast of him. Our meal that is before us today, pictured at the elements of this table, is a binding feast. Today, Paul has pointed us in his words to Christ crucified. Today at this meal, we are pointed in these elements what's well, pictured here to Christ crucified as well. Jesus' body was broken that your sins might be atoned for. His blood was spilled that you might be sanctified and holy and right standing and fellowship before the Father. At the Lord's table is pictured in these elements what unites the true church, the content of the gospel, not just in word, but also in feast is here displayed. What is proclaimed to the ear in preaching of the gospel, Christ crucified, is communicated even to our taste today, so that every true believer 
recognizes in the elements of communion that Jesus Christ is why we are a church, why we are here, and what will sustain us. Here at the table of the Lord, we remember and proclaim Christ crucified at his communion feast. This is the ground for our identity as believers. This is the substance of the church's unity symbolized in these elements today. And it just as it was yesterday, all the way back to when the Passover feast was instituted and in the saint, with the saints of old, as it is today with every church who proclaims Christ crucified and joins us in communion, so to speak. And it will be forever with all the saints in glory when we join at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus Christ is what unites the church. Let us remember and proclaim this, even at his table today, dear Lord. Thank you for the message of your scripture and for how the message is echoed even at your table. As we approach the table in moments, those who are believers in this room, I pray that we would do so with fear, with reverence, fear of you. That we would recognize at your table that because of the wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of Jesus Christ who died for us, we now exist in service of his glory, boasting in the Lord. Lord, I pray that if there are any who are heavy laden, wearied with the burdens of, the day, of daily life, that today they would feel those burdens lifted as they sense your amazing grace, and your sufficiency in your cross. For those that don't know you yet, I pray before they approach this table, they would come to you in repentance and faith, that you would use the proclamation of the word that they might turn from their sins and trust Jesus Christ's blood to wash their sins away. Lord, I pray in all of this that your church would be strengthened and equipped and that a greater unity and love for the brethren and love for you would be reached at your table this day and even in the fellowship that extends following. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music plays, those who have confessed their sins place faith in Jesus Christ. Those are the ones I spoke of earlier who have been born again and are true believers. If you have that assurance in your soul that I believe Jesus Christ because of what his word says, he is my savior and I come to his table knowing I'm a sinner and he alone has saved me. If that resonates with you, if you have turned from your sins and accepted Christ alone as your savior, Christ crucified is your message now of life and your life, hope and direction, then the communion table is open to you. If you have not turned to Christ, if you're not a true believer, if you're not quite sure what all this means, do not come to the table. If you have questions about what the gospel is, and if you have a hope to be saved, then come to myself or another of the church leaders and let us talk about that. But for now, let us revere the Lord's table, which is open to those who in right heart have considered Jesus, their author, the author and finisher of their faith, have confessed their sins and believe in him, and for you, the table of the Lord is now open. For those who are seated closest to the back, would you file down the aisle and serve yourselves and return to your seat? Once all the elements have been distributed, I will return and we will take of them together. Welcome to the Lord's table. <laughs>